London. Um, London's the New Zealand sales manager for Carfields Grain and Seed, and he's here to have a chat to us about managing and prioritising our agronomic decisions through these tight times. Um, he's a passionate agronomist and has um, built up a great um, toolbox over the years to provide us with some top tips. So, London, we'll jump through into it. Thanks, Nicole. Um, yes, yeah, so like Nicole said in, in this, um, you know, this segment here, I've, I've sort of tailored this to the shepherds and the shepherdesses, um, and this is more probably aligned to, uh, you know, a bit of agronomy, a bit of agronomy 101 um, yeah. around some, you know, some key species and attributes because, you know, that's stuff that I think, you know, you guys should know because um, there are some intricacies there. And then it's probably the meat and the sandwiches, the, uh, you know, the grazing management and, and that side of it because it's something that can get overlooked and, and again, this is, you know, we've got a little bit of time to dive into a really chunky topic. So, you know, my key objective here is just to, you know, throw some sound bites out and if that stimulates something for you to then go away and dive a bit deeper into and follow up with either people or literature. Um, you know, that's my key objective with um, this presentation and, and this topic because there's only so much we can cover. Um, you know, so, we, so when you're diving into the species, you know, there's, there's so many of them and, um, you know, it can be very daunting and, um, you know, it's because you've got species, then you've got varieties and, and different things. But, you know, like it or not, the rye grass is still the, the most widely sown species in New Zealand from a pasture point of view. It adds the most to our GDP um, than any other forage. So, you know, it's 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 a pretty chunky product and, um, you know, there's lots of different types. So, you know, whether it's ploidy around, you know, tetraploids and diploids or endophytes or longevity. So again, it's it's it, there's ryegrass, but it's also understanding ryegrass also for what it is and, and, and what you need. Um, yeah, but the main thing that really keen to understand is, is that root structure, because <clears throat> I think we sometimes overstate what we try to get out of ryegrass. So that root structure really is what I'd call a medium. Um, I'd love to be able to draw it for you, but uh, did that on the night. But it's just playing in that medium range, so that's harvesting you know nutrient and moisture from there. So you know if you're getting under stress in those times a lot, then that part of the zone will you know ryegrass might not be for you. Um, but real advantage is it's it's really lightning quick to establish um, grazing management, pretty robust. Um, you know, and then that addition of endophyte to perennial species. Um, you know, really Do you does. want to just describe that endophyte and what that means, Linda? Yep. Yeah, so endophytes have evolved a lot over the years, and you know a lot of the first ones were quite animal um, hard on animals. So they you would have heard of grass staggers and, and autumnal thrift and all that. So they were very good at protecting the plant. So just they were you know so basically they're just a fungus that occurs in the plant, and so a lot of the you know the original ones were wild endophytes that just naturally occurred whereas now what we're dealing with a lot more are novel endophytes that are you know designed for a purpose and a lot more animal friendly so they're naturally well and an, a fungus that occurs in a plant now whether it you know being injected or, or bred you know with crossing plants um, and what it basically does is just give the plant a, a level of, it, of insect protection and so that is, that is there for, you know, depending on the variety, the lifetime of the plant, um, but it has to transfer between plants. So that basically gives you some, you know, protection against bugs like Argentine stem weevil, um, you know, mainly would be the main one. And, you know, the grass grub one's still got a long way to go. But, yeah, pretty much an endophyte is something that, you know, a fungus that allows the plant to um, protect, protect against certain bugs. And I'm not going to go into which ones do what, but, um, the key point is AR1 is completely animal safe and can put across any system um, and give you good Argentine stem weevil protection. AR37 is another end of fight that's been brought to the market quite a few years ago um, to give you, you know, more robust bug protection and pick up prior, but just watch it in deer, don't put it into deer and or horse situations. So that's again highlights the key to just understand where you're putting yes. it and what you're doing with it. But no, it's pretty cool. It's, it's So when you look long-term on insecticide use and and all that sort of thing, um, you know, endophytes can hopefully have a part to play in us trying to limit the amount of, you know, chemicals we need to, need yes. to, um, to use. future sustainability. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, again, a, a bit of a negative, I suppose, is, hey, it's, it starts to shut down at 24 degrees, so goes back to that root structure and it is what it is so if you, you know getting a lot of temperatures over that well um you know it's it's it might be the species not for you so you know but it does like those cooler conditions you know and medium conditions from a from a heat point of view um but now still a still a heck of a species that um adds a lot to our bottom line 
Um, tall fescue, um, not a lot may have heard about this, but <clears throat> it, it's sort of the opposite, really. It, it loves the heat and, um, you know, has got a big, what I call a dreadlocky root structure. Um, so that gives this plant the real ability to harvest moisture and nutrient from a, uh, from a great depth. Um, that root structure also allows it to be very, you know, tolerant of things like grass grub. And, um, you know, that's just basically more bites, I suppose, for the grub, really. You've just got this big engine underneath that's just um, fighting that off. Um, I, you know, I'm a big fan of lactation feed and, and this thing's, you know, unbeatable in this early spring from a yield point of view. Um, you know, but, and, but then to get the most from it, we really have to, from this species, we really have to have our grazing management dialed right in um, because it is the sort of species once it gets to sort of, to, to more um, higher covers, the quality does drop. So, you know, grazing management's a big key here. Mm. Um, and, you know, we think, you know, it is, we're talking about ryegrass bouncing out of the ground, fescue is slow. So, you know, you've got to manage that from an expectation point of view and also how late you sow in the autumn. Um, you know, so just, you know, watch that. Um, and, you know, we, there are some species I'll talk about soon, but we don't mix it with other grasses to maybe mask that slowness or to cover some troughs in with the feed curves. So, you know, when you're doing fescue, you dial up your legumes and your herbs if you need to, but just watch, you know, don't mixing too many other grasses with it because it can, it can't really handle it. It's quite a soft species at the start. Um, you know, but, you know, I, I can't stress enough the main, you know, the advantages of this product at lactation are huge, but, mm. you know, I can't hide enough the grazing management and side of it to get the most out of this thing because um, it is key. Um, Coxfit, so Coxfit's been around a long time. Um, it's one of the most persistent perennial species we've got. Um, it's quite interesting. It, it actually probably plays in a similar root zone to um, ryegrass, if not shallower, to be fair. It's just got a lot of these fibrous roots um, and this thing called a crown. Um, and the crown is basically the, the battery of the plant and it builds up carbohydrate and that's what gives it its robustness. It's the ultimate scavenger for both nutrient and moisture. Um, you know, so, you know, a lot of the time people say they might have a, a crown, a clumpless coxfoot or something like that. It's, it's a coxfoot still needs a certain amount of clump to survive because it gets mm. that, you know, robustness from that. And so but what we're probably doing is, yep, species got better and, but we're just managing coxfoot a bit differently now. We're managing it like ryegrass and putting higher sowing rates in and, and doing things. So it's still important to acknowledge if someone says they've got a clumpless coxfoot, it's not coxfoot. Um, I talked before about the grazing management of fescue. This thing, you can actually apply quite relaxed grazing management, not saying mm. don't apply grazing management, but um, it, you don't have to be day perfect with this thing. Um, and I more mean that over rather than under. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it is a bit of a flexible species in that space. Um, talked about fescue needing high fertility. This thing can perform as long as it's got sufficient nitrogen at a, at a medium to low fertility. Um, so again, that can, it can probably go a bit wider. Um, I talked about fescue being slow to establish. This is slower again. So it sort of goes ryegrass, fescue, coxfoot from an establishment speed. Um, so again, we've got to, we've got to manage that um, from a sowing date. But the cool thing about this, if if wanting to, and as long as we're clear on expectation, we can add some other grasses with it to help bolster up that first sort of one to two years while this thing is getting its um you know getting its groove on, um because it can stay a small plant a long time, um mm. and handle that. So you know there is that ability there, but you know underutilized species, but. It still needs to be managed and, um, you know, just a hugely nitrogen efficient species too. And a lot of people say my coxfoot always looks pale and yeah, that's right. But I think it's just because it's just taking everything and, um, you know, it's, it's a heck of a scavenger. Um, white clover, um, it's a bit like ryegrass, it's still the most widely sown legume in New Zealand. So it's, um, mm. you know, so it's you know, highly important. It's called a don't say this weird too much, but a stoloniferous plant. And um, and basically what that means is you'll you'll get basically, say you plant one seed, what it then does is just track across the ground, putting in little basically roots along the on, on the top of the ground. Um, and then and they'll actually turn into into plants. So they're called this is the mother, and they'll just turn into what we call daughter tillers or daughters. Um, and then what actually happens with white clover is after 18 months, that mother plant actually dies. 
Um, but the cool thing about white is, you know, you're getting your one seed, you're getting multiple plants, if that makes sense. So it's, mm. it's, it's actually quite cool that you're getting more for your, you know, for your just your one seed. But, you know, as you can imagine, we need space for that to allow to express that. So, you know, mm. we stack in rye grass, we stack in white clover. If we don't actually give it space to do what we talked about, it won't be able to, you know, um, do what it wants to do. Um, brings its own end. That goes without saying. It's a legume, right? Um, shallowest root structure doesn't dive deep like some legumes do. Um, so that again, pretty self-explained. Um, and like I said, it needs a light and some heat to really perform. So you know, think of that when you're doing your grazing management and your and your mixes and that sort of thing. Um, but no, it's a it's a great tool to keep um, crew protein up and um, in both dairy and sheep and beef pastures. It's milk in the vat. It's live weight gain. Um, so it's, it's a good, uh, pretty robust species. It'd be the ryegrass, the legume species, basically is how I would uh, describe it. Um, red clover, um, again, probably a species that's continuing to grow in popularity. Um, you know, main difference versus white, it's obviously red, um, but it's tap rooted. So it's, you know, it does area root down, um, but that point there, one plant, one seed. So remember we talked about white clover going like that and putting off little roots. With the red clover, we just get that one plant from one seed. Um, so yep, that gives it some drought tolerance um, versus say white, um, mm -hmm. but definitely won't spread like white or filling gaps. Um, likes good dirt and good heat, I just call it a short-term lucerne. So, you know, it's, it's, it's probably just a, a, a product you can use and say heavier soils versus lucerne in a more short-term way. Um, and just the wee ID fact, like if you if you're wondering in your pastures if you've got white, uh, sorry, red clover, um, just you know just flip over some leaves and, and look for some hairs. And so red's hairy on the back, um, white, you know, not it's shiny and green. So just you know that's a little short thing you can um, hack you can do there. Brings its own in again. Um, so for every ton we're growing, we're getting those 25 units in a grazing system. It is short lived, so it's, it wouldn't be as perennial as um, as white. Um, but I think what it adds in yield at those first, you know, three to four years is definitely worth it. Um, it a thing called estrogen, and so the more traditional red clovers that were used through the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s um, were quite high in a thing called estrogen because that's what red clover produces. And so that what that is is they it's it affects fecundity of stock, so fertility. So it doesn't affect the ability for that ewe to get in lamb. It just may affect their her ability to have multiples. Mm. Um, and just to touch on estrogen, what's, so what's happened there, so I don't want you to focus on it too much, is the breeders have actually, most of the good red clovers, proprietary red clovers on the market now are low in estrogen. So, you know, they definitely have, um, you know, looked to breed that out because that was a big hamstring to definitely red clover going further into systems. Um, so yeah, definitely don't be afraid to ask though when you are looking at red clovers that you know it is a variety that is potentially low on estrogen because it will allow you to you know tuck on high you know still tuck on high you know red clover pastures versus mm. um, not. So that would to... be yeah that would be the key management around um, negating that would be not grazing those red clover pastures at that that time, yeah. time of year isn't it yeah 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 like in, a, in a pasture mix you'd be probably fine because you've got a dilution effect right. Yes. Um, but if you've got heavy red clover, whether it be straight stands or very dominant species, I'd still, even though the, the, the new varieties are low, I'd still be probably getting them up to weight and then taking them off to mate somewhere else. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, if you haven't got anything else, it's still going to be better than nothing. But yeah, I'd say to 100% right, still best to up to weight and then mate on something else if you can. Yes. Um, but you'll see them white, so... That's just a bit of a, you know, trip around um, sowing rates, really. Like, so look at your, you know, it's always quite funny when people are putting in, say, less red, more white. Again, they may have their reasons, but it's just, again, a, 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 to remember that, you know, you, you actually double the size seed. So, you, you know, for, say to get the same equivalent of white and red, you almost need double the rate. So it's just making sure you get those right. Um, yeah, and then again, it's great for keeping um Crew proteins up in, in pastures and, and it's a great supplementary product like and, and, and with Italian ryegrasses and you know and that sort of thing. Um and 
and cut and carry systems. Um, sub, not to spend too much time, but subs are a very really good legume, particularly in dryland situations. Um, it's sort of somewhat stolons like white clover, but it's got these things called burrs. You know, white clover went along, went like that. It, it, not crazy, but it's, it goes along on top of the ground, and those, there's these little basically flower that flowers effectively these things, and they turn into burrs, and then they literally just flip over and and bury into the ground. And so then what that product then does is is set hard seed, and and, and so that hard seed then is um will come over multiple years if you manage it correctly. Um, it's an annual clover, so it, to get the most out of it, it's got to be planted in that sort of late summer, autumn period. Um, whereas those, the reds and the whites, you can plant them any time of year. So that's a key point around annual clovers, make sure they're going in in that time. Otherwise, yeah. it's sort of working out why. Um, but yeah, very drought tolerant if allowed. Um, and I think, again, to get the most out of subs, we still probably need that a bit more mild country or mild facing country because it's real bang for buck where it adds um, most value sub is in that early spring period. So places like North Canterbury and Eastern seaboards and, and you know, slightly inland country, it can add some value, but it needs that sort of mildish, not mildish, but just kind of spring temperatures and say some other dry areas experience at that time of year. Um, yeah. But yeah, probably, a, you know, a definitely a well-researched, forage now um, and lots of, I know beef and lamb have done a lot of work in this space to clear North Canterbury so um, you know there's lots of literature around how to get most out of, out of sub clover so won't spend much more time on that um, and probably a bit like this species here too like we've obviously got one of the one of the well voiced well voiced people on this forage in, in the country so it's you know lucerne's you know it's probably a most drought tolerant legume um, highly so that gives it assistance right um, but key point, um, it, its growing point is in the top of the plant, so it's air mm. temperature related. So what you'll see sometimes in an early spring is you actually see lucerne stands, you know, actually kicking off quite early. And, um, and generally it's because they haven't got competition of grass, but it's also too because it's not relying on warm soil temperatures. It's actually just relying on some, some air temperatures. So, um, you know, that's a key point when looking at when you graze and cut this thing. So lucerne's got um, obviously an upright plant, it's got its new growth coming from underneath and so you're looking at cutting timings, really important to get in that in that plant and start seeing where this new growth called the basil buds is coming because again, say if you wanted to push more yield, you may be also, your new growth may be coming up and you may end up cutting that off and delaying that new growth. So it's just important to understand that, you know, that growth is coming from the top and um, we need mm. to manage that um, to optimise it because it can be forgotten about sometimes and, you know, it's, a, it's an important point. Um, winter dormant varieties still seem to be the most optimal ones for us in the central South Island. There is a bit of, you know, winter active stuff getting around, but you want to have minimal frost, obviously, for that. Um, key point of it versus red, red, more heavier soils, probably clay downs. This is like free draining what type soils. Um, you can mix it with grass if you want. But I'd still mix uh, manage it to lucerne. So it does have some rules, you know. You you theoretically should um, in the first event for this not cut, should be a grazing, and it should almost be you know a large amount of flower um, flat yes. event. Um, and then once a year, we generally um, we generally need to probably want to see around that February to May or April period around fifty percent of flower on this to let it build up root reserves and, and, and that sort of thing. So that is definitely worthwhile um, and something that we do need to adhere to to get the most out of Lucent. Uh, plantain, won't spend much time on this, well voiced again, but it's just main point with plantain is it's not a tap rooted plant, it's a fibrous rooted plant. So don't think plantain is drought tolerant. Yep, it responds mm. to uh, moisture quicker than say a ryegrass. And again, it just comes back to that fibrous root system um, you know, rather than tapered, but some people think it is, but it's not. Um, weed control could be challenging, um, you know, because there is limited herbicide options. Um, can we just pause it? For you? it? Just animals can process it faster. Like it's just, it's you know, like legumes, like anything. It's so I've got there fifty percent quicker. So basically, what that means is, you know, they can actually just physically eat more. So it's yes, it's a good feed quality, but it's just that they can physically process it quicker and eat more and therefore give you the benefits. Um, just manage it like a ryegrass. Um, 
and, and you'll get the most out of it around a grazing management point of view. And we all know there's some work going in the urinary nitrogen space um, around the, you know, the effects it does have, have there also. Chicory um, is tap rooted. So, um, you know, I didn't talk about plantain being fibrous. Chicory is, is a deep tap rooted plant. Um, really good feed quality again, which the animal can process fast. Um, it's, it's, it is a short lived species. So, you know, probably one to three years or 18 months to three, you know, two years in the greater South Island. Um, but key point there is 0.4. It is part of the thistle family. Um, so, you know, that's pretty self-explanatory when you're looking at where you're going to put it and where not you're going to put it. So you, if you basically put this forage in and get thistles, you're, um, you're, uh, you definitely are limiting what you can do um, and you'll just end up um, with a panic of thistles, unfortunately. Um, key points of this, second year steam management's key. Um, you know, so in that second spring, so to speak, you definitely have to climb all over it and manage that spring. And so, um, but it'll also be, um, you know, I, in supplementary feed paddocks, because if you're in that second year, if you've got it in supplement paddocks and it's locked up for 60 to 80 days, you're just going to end up with big chicory stems and, and they'll, they'll just end up being rubbish quality. Um, but yeah, prefer, you know, prefers high fertility and free draining soils. Um, plantain's pretty flexible in that space, whereas chicory does like it pretty, um, pretty sweet, and hence why a lot of it goes into straight stand dairy in the North Island, ex-effluent paddocks and stuff like that. So um, yeah, just a bit of a, a species that um, you need to apply some good management to to get the most out of, but you know, can be fitted in. Um, you know, and then the real probably chunky bit, you know, all those forages are great and there's little, little intricacies um, with them all and some will say, might that one's better than that one and da-da-da-da-da and there is gains there, but, you know, grazing management, you know, definitely is the biggest driver of, you know, profitability versus if it's one or the other. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously beef and lamb and, and RPP have got this um, feed smart grazing calculator. There's multiple ones, but... Um, all I'm trying to say is here, this is something that can really help you with um, working out your allocations because, you know, if you look at, you know, probably when you look at, particularly in the winter feed space, what, you know, say it was one of the most limiting factors a lot of the time, generally it's just we're not allocating enough um, and therefore we're, you know, we're underfeeding our animals. So good simple app to, um, well, it's not an app, but go and download and just see where you're at, um, you know, at allocation wise um, to try and hit those targeted live weight gains you're trying to achieve um, yeah because again it's like why why grow it if you're not going to utilize it and get the most out of it so um, just a, you know good we tool there um, the different types set stocking pretty self-explanatory obviously right um, you know we know why we do it and why we have to do it at times um, Things, you know, like rye grasses and the coxfoot-based pastures and, and those sort of things can handle it quite well, I suppose, if you're trying to identify forages that are better or worse. Um, but, you know, by forage, you know, keep grow, growing the most amount of forage and meat per hectare. You know, this whole three to five days in a block or a paddock is, is definitely preferred. And, you know, that can be three to seven, depending on the forage. Um but, you know, I think that is still the sweet spot for trying to grow the most yield, you know, of forage and meat per hectare. Um, so, again, just get your head around that, around, you know, the longer you leave animals in a paddock or a block, they're starting to eat regrowth of forage. And then there is some animals that won't be getting their full allocation of what they need to perform. Um, and then it's, you know, understanding the grazing rounds. So it's, there's obviously different forages that need different lengths of time in between when they've from when they've been grazed to when you can go back. So things like ryegrass, plantain, you know, are, are more your sort of 20 to 22 days, whereas a lot of things like coxfoot, you know, um, lucerne, red clover can blow out to 30, 32. Um, mm. And then, sorry, you could also bring your tall fescue into that sort of short grazing round two at times. So it's, again, it's like going back to those species and just understanding what their length, and that's, again, trying to maximise the quality of the forage and, you know, for both the, the forage and the animal. Um, but you just got to obviously think about your stop water and that sort of thing when you're rotational grazing. So if, you, if you're having to put up electric fences to clean mm. these high value systems is just think about portable troughs and, and stuff like that um, because you still need good stop water to make all this work. But um, now there's no doubt that rotational grazing is probably still the, the most profitable way for both meat and forage per hectare um, when able, when we can. 
um, strip grazing, we know why we do it um, again, but it's just, you know, mainly done in winter time and also to try and get quality back sometimes. So, I, well, you know, it's, it's definitely a good tool to use. Um, but yeah, don't be afraid to throw an old back fence up at times. It's just amazing what regrowth, <coughs> excuse me, you can get um, by just, um, you know, throwing that back fence up if you're halfway across the paddock. Um, and then also if you've got room, it's amazing. you might be able to work half that paddock or able or something like that mm. to just allow you then to only have to worry about half the paddock. So it's just something that we used to get done a lot, which is sort of minimally done now for obvious reasons. But, you know, I think it's just, again, something that can be um, can be done. Um, and of course, just watch your damage. Like it doesn't take much in a strip grazing system to go from being really good and on top of the ground to being um, in, in the ground, so to speak. So it's mm. um, just really watch that shifting frequency versus the weather um, and, and the residuals you try and leave behind. Um, and then I, you know, my last point really, to be fair, is just utilisation and the power of one. You know, like, say you've got a yield of 10 tonne, increasing your grade, your utilisation of forage by 1% or 5% or 10%, you know, that is just stuff that might cost you some time. Yeah, well, you'll be sitting there going, oh, putting up fences, but you, you're, just, you're getting more edible dry matter rather than just leaving it on the ground or not eating it. And this is where, mm-hmm. you know, not to talk about dairy farmers, but they generally do this very well, is they generally consume, you know, a large, a lot larger percentage of what they grow than say a sheep and beef farmer. And there's reasons for that, there's, we know why, but it's just something that I think, again, is a low hanging fruit to try and, you know, get some more on the bottom line while growing the same amount of feed. And, you know, some, I've always been a fan of, you know, fencing fertilizer seed, they go hand in hand and you know, are all really important to basically getting the most out of that. Because why grow it if you're not going to eat it? So, um, so yeah. And um, yeah. So if that's um, that's about that in that space. Cool. Thanks, Lyndon. So it's really, I suppose, integrating. You know, what you're growing, how that plant interacts or acts as far as its growth, and you know, stepping across some of these key things we can do to maximise that. Um, but yeah, that's awesome. Thanks very much for that, Lyndon. Thank you.